This morning I want to talk about how faithfulness can feel overwhelming at times. Do you ever feel like the Christian life is a lot to take on uh, and hard to maintain over a long period of time? With the many laws involved and the many expectations written in the New Testament, it's uh, easy to feel overwhelmed. I believe it's very easy for us, very natural to sometimes get overwhelmed following Jesus Christ. I'll go further and say that it is a natural human emotion to feel overwhelmed just about the things in life in general. Uh, We're we're dramatic creatures, and and it's hard for us to take a lot of things in at once. It's just kind of the way we are. And living the Christian life is certainly no different. It can trigger an overwhelming feeling uh, at times. I said, man, this is just, you know, so we think, this is just a lot to handle. Uh, allow me again to, uh, to put up this visual that we've been using in recent weeks, uh, representing the parameters of the new covenant contract sent from heaven. Uh, this chart uh, pertains really to the discussion this morning, so I'll reference it again. So this is a breakdown of the gospel system and, and how it works, how we can benefit and keep benefiting from the blood of Christ as we've been studying. Uh, the left-hand column denotes your entry process into the wonderful kingdom of Christ, or the signing of your contract, if you will. This is through the plan of salvation. Uh, when you hear, believe, repent, confess, and are baptized, you tap into the precious blood of Jesus Christ that is able to wash away your sins. That's the gift that, that you do not deserve to have access to. Uh, so these are the conditions for accessing this wonderful gift, the blood, for the first time. Next. Upon accessing the blood, you have it in your possession. We've been studying recently the second column, which denotes what after baptism. It's the the conditions for maintaining the blood in your life. So you have the access of Christ's blood through the plan of salvation. You you maintain the blood, though, through the parameters uh, in column number two. So in the, the, the one condition for maintaining the blood of Jesus Christ, which you might call a loaded condition, The Bible says it's faithfulness. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Jesus said, Be thou faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus said to all of his followers, I want you to go out, therefore make disciples. Convince them to be my followers of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Column 1. Now here's column 2. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, amen. So by this concept, we define faithfulness as attempting, uh, putting forth an honest effort to follow all the new covenant laws to the very best of our ability. We are trying to keep every law. So here's where an an attempt is actually made to follow God's laws faithfully, uh, following and actually doing the do's and the don'ts of God's laws, trying hard at this. Uh, you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you know, the, the, the man who, comparing the man who builds his house on the sand to the man who builds his house on the rock. The man, one who built his house on the rock was those who heard the word of the Lord and did them. Those who heard the word of the Lord and did not do them was comparable to the man who built his house on the sand. Uh, will we be perfect in attempting to follow all the laws? No, we won't. You won't be perfect. Uh, and you will slip up. First John chapter 1, verse 8. But this is why heaven ordained the parameters for column number three to help us when we slip up as faithful Christians. Once in Christ uh, and you slip up into sin as a Christian, you must simply pray to God about this sin, repent again, and confess the sin to God. So the second law of pardon, as we often call it, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so we have been hitting this very hard in recent weeks. I put this up here probably five weeks in a row. Uh, I really want to emphasize, I want to re-emphasize uh, how the contract works and, and, and show what the Scripture says about the simplicity of this agreement that we do have a part to play in this free gift uh, concept. God will continue to do His part. Always. God is faithful. But we got to do our part. And our constant theme, as is the theme of the New Testament, is the encouragement, you can do this. All right, this is a good setup. It uh, doesn't let you off the hook completely for you know no, no, no conditions attached. But you don't have to be perfect. 
There's this nice in-between of faithfulness, and we can do that. You can maintain the blood of Jesus Christ and be counted faithful in the eyes of God. If you just put forth an honest effort, God will be very gracious. If he sees that heart wanting to try, oh man, I, there's a, and I knew that fly. I wish I found it back there. <laughs> I, 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 it was on my songbook. I thought about closing it, but I thought that would scare everybody worse. But um, we'll deal with it. Now what we're going to talk about today is, uh, is the sad tendency, though, for individuals in the body of Christ to feel overwhelmed by this very concept of faithfulness in uh, the Lord's body. So again, the title of our lesson is that faithfulness can feel overwhelming at times. Uh, would you agree with this title? That is very possible for a Christian to feel overwhelmed by trying to uphold the contract. I know I felt overwhelmed with it before. I know by talking to many of you that you have too. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's an overwhelming feeling where Satan tempts us to say, Christian, this is just too much for you to handle and to deal with and to keep doing this. I can't do this. I, can't uphold, I cannot uphold all the things that I need to uphold. Uh, there, there's just so much to think about, so much to give my attention to. It's, you know, it's a long covenant. Gladly, gladly, it's not as long as the old covenant. But so many laws to remember, so many things. Every single day, you know, Job said, why do you test man every moment? And that's true. So, you know, we say I'm overwhelmed and I I just feel like this is not going to end with me being successful in the judgment day. I just don't think I can make it to heaven. And quite frankly, this is how many Christian, faithful Christians think. Uh, And it can happen to all of us at times where we get the pessimistic mindset, mindset about this. So what we're going to discuss this morning is that much of this pessimistic, that's hard to say, pessimistic mindset surrounding the contract uh, really revolves around a misunderstanding about God's nature and his heart to truly want to forgive those who are faithful. And when we understand the faithful concept uh, and admitting when we know we've sinned, that's a big part of it. We, so we misunderstand God's gracious heart at times when we think that he's so ready to condemn those who are actually making an attempt at the things we're talking about. Uh, and we misunderstand God's goodness. Also, I think many times that this mindset involves actually a mis- misunderstanding about how the contract actually works and how it may be utilized truly in the life of a faithful Christian. Uh, So for the first part of this lesson, I want to start by thinking about how we oftentimes uh, become overwhelmed. How do we get overwhelmed when following this setup? And how to get then some peace by understanding these things when we start feeling overwhelmed. So when Scripture tells us that, that this setup gives us the victory, it's sad that so many Christians don't feel that they have the victory, have no confidence in salvation. And we could use some, some uh, encouragement in this regard so to motivate and to instruct. Uh, so what, what things produce an overwhelming emotion, you might ask, in our lives with regard to the contract? What makes us overwhelmed? As we start here, let me give you five reasons uh, for why we become overwhelmed in our Christian walk. So five reasons. And then after this list of five, I'll give you a helpful list on how to overcome uh, these things. So, but first, faithfulness can feel overwhelming at times because, number one, out of five. Because you might say, there are so many laws to consider at one time. That overwhelms me, we say. Got to be faithful to all these laws. And do you ever feel that way? We say, man, I got to keep reading this book. There's a lot in here. We say, I have to keep track of, of, of keeping impure desires out of my life. All the works of the flesh, lust, fornication, drunkenness. And then there's all lying, evil communication, things that come out of my mouth. The list is long. Well, at the same time, I have to try to evangelize, assemble with the saints, do good deeds in this world, be a good person. Remember to pray. Remember to admit when I fall short. Uh, Remember to study my Bible every day. If I'm a father, I have to keep the specific commands for a father written in scripture. If I'm a mother, I have to keep the commands for a mother and so on and so forth. And an intimidating passage in scripture is James chapter two and verse 10, which says, for whoever shall keep the whole law 
and yet stumble in one point. He is guilty of all. The idea here says, Christians, if you ignore one of the laws or some of the laws of God while keeping the rest, and you continue ignoring part of the law, continuing in that path, you'll be counted as unfaithful. For neglecting part of the law, you can't do that and be counted faithful. This is how it works. Okay? Um, I don't know precisely how many laws of God are accounted for under the new covenant. I, I don't. I mean, I suppose I try to go and count them, but let's just say for sake of explaining this this morning that there are 100 specific New Testament commands and laws, the do's and don'ts of Christianity under column two. Uh, This passage here in James 2 teaches that faithfulness involves giving an honest effort, listen, to all 100 of the law, to the very best of our ability. That's faithfulness. Every single law attempted, not ignored. For if we sin willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. He was chapter 10, verse 26. So we, we explained faithfulness earlier as an attempt, attempting to keep all of the new covenant law to the best of our ability. But we, we, we say, man, but there are a lot. And there are a lot of specifics that it's hard to keep track of. I'm worried about that. So we, we think of this as an intimidating task saying, There are dozens, there are hundreds of specific detailed commandments to try to be faithful to, and that overwhelms me. How could I possibly be made aware of them all and keep them all? Uh, By the way, we say this complaint as as though we think perfection is required. Uh, And we have an incorrect mindset on how it even works. We think we have to be sinless and perfect, and we talk about that a lot. But perfection is not what the scripture teaches, nor should we expect it from ourselves. And sometimes I think we might even be harder on ourselves than God would be on ourselves. Now I've noticed sometimes that the individuals are harder on themselves specifically than they would be on others in the church. That they wouldn't judge others as harshly as they judge themselves. So I'll give you points number two and three uh, as we continue to discuss. Uh, So number one, Christians feel overwhelmed because there are just so many laws to consider at one time. Number two, we often feel uh, overwhelmed because we, we feel that perfection is required. And number two, we often fall short and feel guilty. Linking back to number two, we feel guilty because oh, I was supposed to be perfect, but I wasn't perfect. Well, he, he never told you that you were going to be perfect. In fact, just the opposite. So it's, we sometimes view this concept as the need for perfect compliance. And I've talked to a lot of people who say, you teach it wrong, you teach perfection. We don't teach perfection. We don't. The Bible doesn't teach it either. Um, And and, uh, so sometimes we view this concept as a need for perfect compliance or else we're lost instead of a need for a perfect attempt at compliance or else we're lost. Now, I want you to know there's a difference. Perfect compliance, I said, versus a perfect attempt at compliance. Do you see there's kind of a difference there? See, the point I'm making is that we must understand, or that, that we misunderstand the functioning of the contract and thinking that adhering to every single law means being perfect to every single law. That's not what it means. That's not what uh, James 2 and verse 10 means. Though we, we, we wouldn't say that we believe that. Sometimes we live like we believe that. But no, all that faithfulness means is to give your best effort toward all the laws not purposefully and knowingly violating any of them or leaving any of them out. That's faithfulness. By, by the way, go back to the wording of what Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 20 that we just read. He said, teaching the disciples to do what? Observe all things that I have commanded you. Jesus did not say, be perfect at all things that I have commanded you. So we must understand there is a difference. Uh, so how many of the commands does Jesus expect us to make an attempt at? The idea here is all of them. 100% of the laws we must make an honest attempt at and pursue it. And he knows if you ain't trying at one, and he knows about willful sin, of I know this is in the law, but I don't do it. That's unfaithfulness. And God's looking at that. So part of you... Part of you being counted faithful in the end will be your willingness and your honesty with the laws of God and your possession. 
And God will be looking to see if you're trying to twist any of his commands and expectations so that you don't have to do them. So a lot of people do. Or if you're trying your hardest to comply with an honest and a true effort and a true heart. Remember 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, the famous study passage. You know, and as you're searching the scriptures, as you're studying to show yourself approved unto God as God's workman, what's the next part say? That you rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16 says that some twist the scriptures when they read it. But the faithful are those who rightly divide the scripture in honesty and truth. And then we try to keep it. So we see the command from the Lord, for example, not to lie. So in honest compliance with the scripture and God's command, we make it our goal in life not to go about lying or telling a falsehood. And if you happen to slip up in that, uh, just use the second law, law of pardon and keep on moving. Keep going. You're all good. Don't be so disheartened that you messed up as long as you're not purposefully uh, messing up and abusing God's grace. Uh, just, just pick your head up and keep moving and just keep have some patience. And that is the concept of faithfulness over time. Uh, so then, um, you know, going through some more uh, specific examples, there are a lot of them, but God tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Hebrews 10, 25. Don't miss the gatherings of the Christian people. God tells us to evangelize. Hard command, Matthew, or Mark chapter 16, and verse 15. God tells us to love our neighbor, Mark chapter 12, verse 31, and on and on the list goes. But uh, the idea here is this. The Christian says, with the laws, I will try, I will comply to 100% of the laws of God. I'll make a 100% effort to be at every assembly. I'm making that my goal. I, I will try to be here at every assembly I'll give a 100% effort in evangelism. I'll make it a priority in my life. And yes, I'll always try to love my neighbor as myself. I'll make an attempt to comply. I'll try. And I'll give my, my effort to that. Then if you feel that you've fallen short in one of these areas, you confess that sin in prayer to God. And in repentance, you determine to get better at it. And that's where spiritual maturity comes over time. You get better because you've been trying this whole time. And then there will be growth. God says that that's the way of living that keeps you cleansed. Faithfulness. That's not a perfection requirement, but an attitude requirement with an honest heart and an honest effort. Of course, part of the contract includes several clauses in the New Testament showing us that we must not seek to abuse the, con the continual forgiveness of sins either. You can't, don't try to abuse this. Hebrews 10, 10 26, we, we talked about if we keep sinning on purpose, Romans 6 and verse 1, if we sin more and more, the grace may abound. Hebrews 10, 26, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sins. You won't cheat. You can't cheat this system because God's watching you and knows your heart the whole time. Don't try to cheat it. Actually live it with genuine faith. Um, but again, at the same time, this system is not a, a system that requires perfection at its core. Faithfulness means you're attempting every law and mindful of every law. So if a person comes along as a Christian, sees one of the laws such as attendance or evangelism, and he says, well, I'll try every other law that there is, I, 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 but not that one. That law is a hard one for me to follow. It's, it's very difficult. James chapter 2 and verse 10 teaches us that we transgress and we fall short if we ignore one of the laws. Ignoring a law or a set of laws, part of the law, that's unfaithfulness. You can't do that. Ignoring a law is not pleasing to God. Uh, but when a Christian looks at all the laws of God and says, you know, I know I won't ever be perfect at it, but I'm going to try all of them. I'm going to give an honest effort. I'm going to try to follow them all. Then there is abundant grace for that individual because he's keeping the condition of faithfulness. And God's looking to see if you're trying at that. And so I ask you this morning, uh, how are you doing with this? I'm trying every single law of God. I won't ask you if you're being perfect with regards to every law because I know the answer. And that's not a biblical question. I know the answer is no. But I will ask you this. Are you putting forth a pure, true effort 
to keep every New Testament command. Are you trying at every, every command? Do you ignore any of the commandments? And willfully so? And you know you're not keeping one of the commands? Do you pretend that you're faithful while ignoring one or two of the, the, your least favorite commands in the law or the hardest ones for you to follow? So yes, if you ignore a law or disobey it on purpose and you keep in that path, you will be counted as unfaithful. So, uh, But if you do not ignore it, but if you try to obey it, then the Lord will count you faithful in this setup no matter what. You just keep trying. Then use that third column every time you feel that you slipped up and didn't, and you fell short of perfection. Just keep admitting to God, I understand where I messed up. Here's where I'm trying to get better. And we, we've said this a lot with evangelism, by the way. I think sometimes we feel guilty because that's just one of the hardest ones in our lives to try to do. But you don't have to be a master evangelist baptizing hundreds of souls every year in order to please God. You don't. But you have to be trying your hardest to plant seeds. And I ask you with that command, are you trying your hardest at this? Because remember, sowing seed is the command, getting the, the word of God to people's hearts. While baptisms and, dis, and, and obedience from them, that's, that's, that's their effort. That's, that's not your requirement. You just plant the seed, the baptisms, and the obedience is a result from you sowing the seed. So yes, if you're, if you're not trying your hardest with every command, if you're ignoring a certain command, then it is very possible, no, it's likely that you will be found unfaithful. Uh, so be honest with the laws of God. And so I, I think it's good to do personal evaluation all the time. Write down your biggest weaknesses. Pray about your weaknesses. So can you, can you think of one of the New Testament commands right now? Think it in your head right now. That perhaps, I mean, hopefully you won't be able to, but that you're perhaps sinning willfully against this law or ignoring it, not trying. That's the command I want you to give your attention to today. So yes, this process is simple. Uh, what we're studying is that we get overwhelmed when we misrepresent the contract, thinking that it just says compliance must be perfect and sinless, when it actually just says you've got to be faithful to it. And I just we don't get the difference sometimes as human beings. All right, next, number four. Uh, here's another reason that we get overwhelmed as we're trying to adhere to every law faithfully. We get overwhelmed because, number four, we're worried maybe that we're off on something. Now, this one's a little bit different than what we've been discussing up here until this point. Okay, I want you to understand the difference. Here we're talking about the individual who is living faithfully, giving due diligence to every command with the full heart, but a worry comes about that says this. What if my understanding, though, of Scripture is wrong somewhere? And I'm unfaithful because of ignorance, not through willful sin, but a um, mistake of human error in understanding the Bible. I'm scared about that. Trying to understand the full law and getting a, getting a clear visual picture, being honest with it, that's a little scary. And that we feel, well, what if, what if I don't have a true picture of the true con contract? What if I've been taught wrong? What if I have a wrong understanding? A Christian says, well, what if all, out of all 100 commands from God, and again, 100, the number is a hypothetical number, but what if out of all 100 New Testament commands, what if my understanding is incorrect on one or two of those laws? And I don't understand that I'm off on those things. And then I transgress. You know, Galatians chapter 5, verse 20 says the heresy or teaching false doctrine will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that scares us. What if I make a mistake in my reading of God's word and I just take the wrong stance somewhere and I've been holding to an error? But what if in our diligence to study the word of God, we, we came to the wrong understanding of something? and are making a mistake in our biblical theology. Some Christians worry about this and say, I'm trying. I'm trying hard to keep all these laws, but I sure hope that I'm holding to the real truth and I'm upholding the right things. I hope I've not been led astray. So my answer to that concern, the Bible's answer to that concern, I think is answered in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to those who really wanted to know the full truth, He said, ask. 
and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who, I'll insert here, truly asks, receives. And he who truly seeks, finds. And to him who truly knocks, it will be opened. The idea presented in this passage says that if, if you really want to know the truth, if you're one of those people who say, I want to serve God with all my heart, I want to know the truth so badly, then it's God's promise that you will know. And you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, he said to his true followers. Well, how can I know? In what way? If you want to know the truth honestly and sincerely, and if I want to see the ins and outs of the covenant without any haziness to it, then God says, listen, I set it up so that those with honest hearts could find the truth if they actually wanted it. Jesus gave the wonderful promise in John 8, 32, two faithful followers who said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He said in John, 1 John 2, verse 21, John says to the early Christians, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. So God said about the truth, it can be known. It will be known. And it is. You can clearly see all 100 components of the contract, so to speak, so that you can choose to comply if you like, if you really want to follow God. And it's been written so plainly that it takes some digging, but you can find it. And so what we need to do if we're dying for this knowledge of the truth, what do we do? Well, search the scriptures daily, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Study to show yourself approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2, 15. 2 Peter 1, verse 3 tells us plainly that God has given to us in the scripture all things that pertain to life and godliness. You got it all, every Christian. You, we have it. But sometimes we don't know it because we don't study it. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, he said in the Old Testament. He said, I gave you everything you need to know under the Old Testament time period that would judge your soul then. He said, but you didn't ever look into it. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 says, it's all been given by inspiration of God, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We can know the truth. So no, a Christian over time does not have to worry about missing something in the law of God. If they're studying the Word and they're honest with the text, you can know the truth. The Scripture is plain and the Scripture is straightforward. And those with honest hearts, and sometimes maybe if someone has a worry about some certain area, study that area. Dig in. But those with honest hearts and a true desire to obey will find the truth in Scripture, and that's a promise. Uh, so are you trying? Are you being honest? Are you actually reading the Scripture? Uh, so those who do not want the truth, though, they will be blinded by their own desires, and they'll rewrite. Tw they'll tw that's when people twist Scripture. Number five, uh, another reason we get overwhelmed in Christianity is this, because we feel like we're guessing about our spiritual condition all the time. We just feel like I can't know one way or the other. Now, in a sense, I think there are parts of this that we are left guessing about in a biblical sense. Uh, but in another sense, biblically, we're not left guessing at all. First uh, John chapter 5, verse 13, one of the verse, verses we go to a lot. John says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, right? Christians, that you may know you have eternal life. Emphasis on the word know. You're not left to guess about your salvation in the sense that John's talking about. You can know you have it. You're going to heaven, he said. And this is by looking into what's written. John says, These things I've written to you who believe in the Son of God that you may know. And then understanding these very concepts in Scripture and knowing how God's, and being taught about how God's grace is applied in our lives like we've been studying. Then you can know you have it by what's written. Right? And, so, and if you are abiding in the conditions we've been discussing, he said, then you have eternal life. If you are living unfaithfully, then an honest heart can know that they're in deep trouble and in need of repentance. So yes, the Word of God is the X factor here. By it, we can know and we can be certain of where we're at. The Bible is a self-evaluation form. That's what God gave us. 
But yes, then someone might argue that there is a sense in which we're left guessing in some senses about eternal life. That we just won't know until Jesus comes back. We're left guessing in a sense that although it's, it's perfectly defined in the Scripture, what happens? It's like we've been saying. Sometimes our understanding of the Scripture uh, is a little bit less than par. And we misrepresent the Scriptures. Either we're dishonest or we're not working very hard at, at studying the truth. And thus, without knowledge, without time spent in the Word of God, that's when we feel like we're guessing. So again, I mean, really, human emotion comes into this too sometimes. Even though we know what it says, we're just worried. So again, we worry that perhaps we read the Scripture wrong or that we wonder, is, is God counting me faithful in the life I'm living? But the truth is, only the Word of God can bring you any clarity if you feel that you've been left guessing. Go to the Word. Keep, you know, study more. Go searching for the answers in heaven, says you will find them. James chapter 1, verse 25 says, He who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer from what he read, but a doer from what he read, this one will be blessed in what he does. So you read it, and you don't just leave it there and not do it. You read it and do it. Just like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the man who built his house on the rock, use the word. Through it, you may, may build up that confidence when you study the vastness of this contract. Faith is built by hearing the word of God, the Bible says. The word of God, which is able to build you up, it says, and it produces confidence in you. As we now will begin to close here, allow me to give you some tips. Quick tips here. I'm going to give you 10 of them uh, to take home on this important topic. Uh, do you often feel overwhelmed and pessimistic about your Christian walk? Just remember these 10 things. Uh, you, we could dig into these more than I'm going to, but number one, remember first off that we serve a gracious and merciful God. We must remember that, that the God of heaven is fair and he is just we need to remember that he has set up this gospel system, this awesome contract, not because he's eager to send us to hell, but because he is eager to send us to heaven. And he's not just giving it to us, but he wants to make us work a little bit. He wants so badly for you to use this system and to learn righteousness and, and have an overarching theme in your life of righteousness and enter in because you're trusting God. Sometimes the problem we have is that knowing the righteous wrath of God against sin, we forget that God has a side to him that is ready to forgive and to reward. We've got to balance the goodness and the severity of God. Uh, in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah said about God in the Old Testament, Lord, I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, who is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Likewise, God said about himself in Ezekiel 33 and verse 11, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? So we need to remember this side of God in our discussion always, understanding that he set this up for your success. And it can be done. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I didn't set this up in an impossible fashion. You can do it. Number two, also remember that um, what is written is for confidence building and joy. I'm referencing the book of 1 John mainly here, which talks a lot about this. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, he says, these things I have written to you that your joy may be full. I want you to feel like you're going to heaven. I write this so that, uh, to set you at ease, Christian, to produce some peace about your salvation, not just constant anxiety and worry about it. Chapter 5, verse 13, again, I've written that you may know you have eternal life. And that's a game changer when we can get to that point. Uh, the writings of Scripture build our confidence because we look into the spiritual mirror, which tells us plainly the conditions uh, as a spiritual mirror. Number three theme of this lesson. Remember faithfulness and not perfection. Stop placing unrealistic expectations on your part of the gospel plan. Right? God's perfect. You won't be. Get that. The Bible says if we say that we have not sinned, 
We make him a liar and the truth is not in uh, 1 John 1 verse 10. So stop acting like you're going to be perfect um, and just fess up when you are not perfect. Number four, remember God is watching for an obedient heart. God watches your course of life. He looks into the thoughts and intents of man's heart every minute, every moment, every second. And if you mold your heart into God's image and you passionately seek to obey to the best of your ability, God will be so eager to reward you and he will not be so quick to condemn and, and, and get you when you slip up. He's looking to see the theme of your life. Number five, remember to work on your specific weaknesses. James chapter 2 and verse 10. You remember the passage we read earlier that said, if you ignore one of the laws, you'll be counted as unfaithful. Well, in response, then pinpoint with laser focus your weaknesses. So that, uh, that so often push you toward unfaithfulness. You know, if, if lust, for example, becomes your Achilles heel on a regular basis, then be ultra aware of your main personal weakness. Write your personal weaknesses down. Yours are, might be different than mine. Write yours down. If it's the love for money, take special note of that, which causes you to stumble. And the Bible says that, that whoever shall stumble in one point is guilty of all, then we need to pinpoint that part that we stumble in and work on it. And that's what God wants us to do. Uh, number six, remember also to seek God with your whole heart. James chapter, or Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Not half your heart. Don't come at this trying to get to heaven with half energy. Listen precisely to what God said in Jeremiah 29, 13. It's a really good verse. God said, you will seek me and find me. You will. When? What? You search for me with all your heart. Ah, go searching for God and begin to learn his ways. But remember, do so like your life depends on it or else it's not going to happen. You're not going to find God if you're not searching with all your heart. You've got to put all your effort into this. Well, that, that, does that mean that I'm, I'm, uh, he's the master of my life. Well, that's exactly what it says. That's the first, that's my priority in life. Yeah, that's what it says. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. Give up your life. Make him the number one priority in life. I'm going I'm to steal an illustration from a financial guy I listen to sometimes. His name is Dave Ramsey. Uh, I listen to him on YouTube. Dave Ramsey's specialty is on helping motivate people to get out of debt. Uh, go listen to him sometime. He's, he's a good, good guy about that. He says the only way, though, to tackle debt is, quote, with gazelle intensity. Uh, do you know what gazelle intensity means? The idea here is to picture a lion who is chasing a gazelle. Put yourself in the position of the gazelle. And what does that gazelle start to do when his life is in imminent danger? He starts, quite literally, running for his life. With all of his little heart, he starts running. And he's scared to death of this. And he, and he makes it the most, I mean, he doesn't think about anything else. You see, the gazelle, when being hunted, does not start jogging away from the lion. The gazelle does not yawn and take the slow, scenic route. He runs because his life depends on it, and it's that important. Do you know when some people seek after God, they do so with a leisurely walk, not a run? With some people in this world who claim that they're trying to figure out eternal life, I just don't know. They claim that they're trying to get a hold of this. They have no, no, but at the same time, they have no sense of urgency in this all-important matter of going to heaven. And those people never truly find the truth. But like a gazelle who in laziness allows the lion to run up on his heels, some people in this world, sorry to put it this way, just don't want to go to heaven badly enough. Not enough effort is given. You don't care enough. Not enough time is spent. And in, in the end, your heart didn't want God badly enough. God says, no. No. You won't be successful. You won't with half-hearted service. You have to run with all your heart towards me. So Jeremiah 29, 13 again says, you will, you will seek me and you will find me. When you search for me with all your heart.
we, we, we get overwhelmed in this, but one thing, uh, one of the things that we need to do is to contemplate always the seriousness of what we're chasing or what's chasing us. Right? We're running away from hell and trying to take safety in God in heaven. And when you get overwhelmed and are ready to quit, just remember what's at stake here. And that'll motivate you. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to be separated from God forever. For time's sake, I'll just list the last four. Number seven, when you get overwhelmed, remember one day at a time, one step at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. Things of tomorrow will worry about their own things, Jesus said. Take a breather. Understand, okay, right now, just put one foot, put one Christian foot in front of the other, right? And take baby steps. And then number eight, remember endurance and patience. I'm in this for the long haul. Uh, I, I, need, I need to grab a hold of this and, and, and understand this is, gonna, um, this is my way of life. Number nine, Galatians 6, 9, remember in due season we shall reap if we faint not. A reward is coming. Just keep doing what you're doing. A home in heaven is what you're chasing. And lastly, I thought the words of this song would be good. Uh, to close on. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way for me. Well, the Bible says, if the Bible says you will find the Lord, uh, but only if you search with all your heart, and if you're earnestly pursuing this way, prioritizing purity, prioritizing the kingdom, even though you fall flat on your face all the time. God will find a way to make it work for the ones pursuing him with their whole heart. And God will reward those who seek him with all their heart. And so that is the gospel. Uh, but he wants you to want him. He wants you to pursue him. And so the invitation is yours. Uh, if you're not a Christian, join this fight. Join God's kingdom by hearing the gospel, believing every word of it, repenting of sins. It's going to lead to a change in your life. Confess Christ before men. Be baptized in order to enter the kingdom. You get access to the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. And you just got to remain faithful to this awesome covenant and do everything we were talking about today. Just try your hardest. Use the second law of pardon when you fall short. Uh, so if anyone needs to come uh, for any reason, have a seat on the front row as we stand and as we sing.